Morning Vision Church. Thank you for joining us this Sunday. We're so glad you could be here. If you could go ahead and stand, we're going to get started by worshiping our Lord. In the darkness all alone, growing comfortable, are you scared of
Yes, the kind of thing that breaks a man Breaks him down to his knees Had I been broken more than a time or two But you've helped me be a man oh, 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 Cause all my hope is in Jesus sing it. Lord for so far God we can just have a reminder God our sins are forgiven God I thank you so much Lord for our service so far God Lord as the worship team is just God I feel like all the songs are hitting the right spot today so God we just thank you so much Lord for what you're doing here God we thank you so much God for the weekend God that's kept us safe and brought us here to this point God we thank you so much Lord for the people watching online this morning God Lord, we just thank you so much, God, for who you are and who you say you are. God, we love you. We honor you. We praise you. And in Jesus' name I pray. All God's people said. Amen. Hey, before you say, hey, go ahead and have a seat. Turn to your neighbor. Give them a high five, a fist bump. Tell them they look good. They smell good. Yes. <laughs> Woo, you need some deodorant, Pastor. <laughs> <laughs> good morning to you. Look at somebody and say good morning. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Thank you so much for coming to Vision Church today. Hey, stay on your side. We are, sorry, we stay are excited. Side. <laughs> we got the, the front row is very close today. You guys are in the spit zone later in the message, so it's just pretty close. Uh, but hey, thank you guys for coming today. If you are here for the very first time, you are a very special guest today. Thank you for being here. We'd love for you to connect with us. You can scan this QR code right here. Also, there's various places around the church where you see that QR code as well. At the end of the service, uh, Jonathan and myself and Kevin, we'd love to meet you right over here in our Connect Corner and say hey to you. We have a free gift for you. And again, thank you so much for coming today. You could be anywhere, but you're at church this morning. So thank you. We really, really appreciate it. Yes, thank you so much. Hey, I will just let you know is we are going to be taking an offer the next few moments. So this is the regular offering of today. We're giving our vision offering today. Yes. So as the ushers going around, just know this is for your regular tithes and offerings. We will take up the vision offering later on. So hold that $1,000 check in the back pocket and just hold it for just a little while longer. <laughs> and we want to mention if you uh, don't normally come to Vision Church, you're going, why in the world are you taking two offerings? We've done this. This is only our second time in almost five years. So this is not typical. We've, uh, over the last seven weeks, we've been praying and seeking the Lord and and reserving things for this vision offering that helps with our location and building and different things like that. So again, this first offering that we're about to take is just our normal tithes and offerings. We'll do the vision offering later in the service. So anything you'd like to give a vision offering, please hold that to the end of the service. Pastor, don't let me finish no announcement. Shame. Hey, I, I, I'm, I, joking, I, I'm hey, joking. I had to make no, sure. No, I saw some eyes like, they take up two offers <laughs> in this church? <laughs> just here. All oh, right. <laughs> I want to say one thing real quick before I forget. Kevin, where's, where's Kevin? Right here. Thank you. Kevin, the same spot every Sunday, yeah, there you I mean. go. <laughs> Kevin, last, uh, this past weekend, or the weekend we're in now, Friday and Saturday, Kevin and his team did a youth conference, and it was called Vision Conference right here at our church. It, it was really awesome. We have some students that were, that were there at the conference. We were involved. There was a couple of different churches. It was awesome. 
Last night I was here and this room was turned into, uh, it was, <laughs> I don't even know really how to describe it. It, was, it started off and it was a great service and sermon and awesome. And then it kind of morphed into Soul Train a little bit. I'm not exactly <laughs> sure. Uh, but it was, it was really great. I saw I want to thank Kevin and his team for doing that really awesome event. I also, also want to thank Jonathan because typically we have Recovery Live on Friday night in-house. And Jonathan, being the man of God that he is, is it was focused on the kingdom. And so he took what he did normally, put it online so that Kevin and the students could have the campus on Friday night. So the kingdom working together, I appreciate both of you guys. All right, you got the rest of this? God bless you. Scooter yeah. out. All right. Oh, yeah. All right, cool. All right, let me get in the center where I, where I use land. Scooter on in. All right, we'll also let you know, we also have Bible studies that happen every single Wednesday. So this coming Wednesday, bring for adults. We have some for you. We have some for the tots. Have some for the kids. And also... For the youth, so come. We have no, you have no excuses. Come on Wednesdays, and it's uh, it's it's just a, a great pick me up in the midweek that you come on Sunday, and then you get Bible study on Wednesday. Come to Recovery Live on Friday, and then also get you to church on Sunday as well. So I would love to see you. There's something going on all, all during the week. I also have the clothing ministry that is coming up on April the 20th. Uh, this is one of our outreach ministries of Vision Church. This is the heart and soul of Miss Teresa Young. And if you have any questions about our clothing ministry, want to get more info, and I want to serve in any capacity, you know some people that need some clothes, come see Miss Teresa. She's waving right now. She would love to connect with you. And uh, this is just her heart and part of our outreach ministry here at Vision Church. I'll let you know that we also have men and moms that is coming up on April the 27th. If you have experienced infant uh, loss or pregnancy loss, this is for you. Uh, this is a heart. This is the heart soul of my wife that, that got birth from our miscarriage. And, uh, and uh, just a beautiful thing about that is that our promise came. As you can see, we're holding our promise now. So if you are in that, if you are going through that right now, you experience uh, infant loss or pregnancy loss, this is for you. Come April the 27th, uh, this is uh, another part of our outreach ministry here at Vision Church. And it just is a great support for you to get some uh, hope, healing, and freedom from that as well. All right, we're going to take up our offering this morning. Yes, thank you all so much. Uh, as, uh, as our lead pastor, Scooter, said... Um, Yes, okay, so uh, Mr. Percy Wan, he is our men's ministry leader here uh, for our vision group. Uh, he wants to let you know it's every first Saturday of the month. So every, if, you are a man, if you're a man, raise your hand. And for, oh, okay, I, oh, right here now. Whoa, 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 now. That's some big. He said free breakfast, yeah. and Mr. Percy be cooking now. Yeah. Now, hey, and we ain't talking about just regular old bacon eggs. We're talking about biscuits and gravy. We're talking about sausage, ham. So, huh? And he only, do, he only does it here. His wife said he only does it here. But uh, yes, so every first Saturday of the month, our men's ministry will meet. Also, want to let you know uh, for uh, for the families that have kids, we have a mom and me room. As soon as you walk out this door, it's the first door on your right hand side. Uh, going to that's a mom and me room. We have the live stream going, and there's also a family room for you dads as well. You can go down this hallway. If you pass my office on the left, take that hallway to the left. It's the last room, the left hand side. That is a family room. If the kids get a little cranky and they're like, "I'm tired of hearing this preacher preach," you can go in there and go to our live stream and just have some uh, support in there. There's chairs. There's changing tables for you. So uh, let's go to the Lord. Let's pray together. God, uh, one of our old core values here when we were at Temple Wilson, now we're visiting church, that excitement is contagious, Lord. I pray that we can continue this same excitement, Lord. That God, today is somebody's Sunday. Lord, this past Friday night and this past Saturday was a student's Friday and Saturday. As they experience, God, the conference, God, I pray that they experience the hope, healing, and freedom that only Jesus can give them. God, I pray, Lord, through the rest of the service today, God, that, Lord, the service will speak to somebody that, yes, we are taking up our regular offer and then taking up our vision offer. The vision offer is something we have prayed about and fasted for as families have already given their vision offering and done sales and uh, done all these things, Lord, to get this money to give back to the kingdom. Lord, we're not giving back to Vision Church. We're not giving back to Pastor Scooter or Pastor Jonathan or Pastor Kevin or any director that's here. No, God, we are giving back to your kingdom. Lord, we are being obedient, God, God, because, Lord, obedience is our sacrifice. And, Lord, we know this is a sacrifice, God. We are giving above and beyond more than what we usually do. But, God, it says in your word, God, you will bless that ten times more, Father. So, Lord, we know that we honor you, Father, God. You're going to bless us. So, Lord, let's be with the rest of the service, God, Lord, as we are, God, just bowing at your feet, God, bowing at your altar, God, and bowing, Lord, just say, God, we surrender to you today. God, we love you, we honor you, and we praise you. And in Jesus' name I pray. All God's people said. Amen. All right, y'all check out this video. I am nothing without you. I can 
cannot live without you. I cannot breathe without you. Without you. Without you, I am nothing. I have no purpose, at least that's how I feel. I mean, what's it like to be stuck on top of a mountain where there's beautiful scenery but no air to breathe? No one to fill your lungs with destiny. No one to give you hope to hold on to. No one to hold you close when everyone leaves. It's just you, forgotten, alone. You work day to day, but you know that something's missing. You go back, retrace your steps, and find that you left something behind. That maybe back on that path, there's something you missed. Someone who tried to call you, someone who tried to text, someone you just ignored. You hung a do not disturb sign on the door of your heart and let it rust. Ashes to ashes and dust to dust Return to the earth you must And I know that this is daunting Weighing on your shoulders like a heavy weight But someone carried your mistakes And your life was valued by him And even though you haven't given him the time of day He's been waiting for you Waiting for you to accept what he did for you Waiting for you to realize that you can't do this thing on your own Waiting for you to know that your money Or even your family can't save you It boils down to just you and him so let him in, let him in, let him in. He is God and he is true. Jesus died and rose for you and history can back that up. Your external sources are fried, but an eternal source provides on and on and on. So jump, leap, trust, believe. He's all you need and more. Everything you leave behind is nothing because he has more in store. Oh God. I am nothing without you. I cannot live without you. I cannot breathe without you. Without you. Will you stand with us as we continue to worship? There's a sling in my voice. In a stone in my praise Pushing back when the darkest weapons fall and There's a power on my lips Even death can't defy When the name of our God is lifted high Cause there is Captives let go of those shades, 
Let go of those chains when we praise. Dead man, come out of that grave. Come out of that grave. We sing.
God is so much bigger than troubles I face. Why would I hunger for power or riches or fame? My God is so much better than all of
they have to bow to you, Lord. And we thank you for that. I pray that you would hide Pastor Scooter behind the cross as he gets ready to bring your word to us, Lord, and that you'd prepare our hearts to receive it. You know what we need to hear today, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. You may have a seat. Grateful that you're here this morning. Look at somebody around you and tell them you can sing. That's right. Everybody can sing. Might not be great, but you can sing. Just kidding. Thank you so much for worshiping alongside the worship team today. Thank you for being here. Hey, uh, my name is Scooter, and I'm one of the pastors here, and I just want to again say thank you so much for being here at Vision Church today. So, uh, John chapter 21, if you got a Bible, copy of God's Word, go to John chapter 21. Uh, you can go ahead now, and you know, we're free. You want to use your phone, tablet, computer, all those things, great, fantastic. Uh, also, it'll be on the screen. Where are my paper Bible people at? Hey, I have recently in the last several months become one of you again. Uh, I used my phone for Scripture and all kinds of stuff for a long time. I still do occasionally. But for whatever reason, my brain became so scattered that it was hard to focus with that. So I went back to the paper copy of God's Word, and I love it. I love it. I love it. So John chapter 21, and we're going to jump in in just a second. We're going to start reading in verse 15 of John 21. But until we get to that point, I'm going to bring you up to speed a little bit. But I have a question for you. I have been told many times that the... Most important meal of the day is breakfast. Raise your hand if you would agree with me or not. Okay, you would agree with me. Raise your hand if you do not agree with that and you don't care about breakfast. Okay, so she said, I care about everything. I care about all the meals. She said, I've even made up meals to be in between other meals. Right? Yeah, this is a, we got Lupper and Leonard and all okay, my house. Yeah, what would you say? B B breakfast, we got, we got breakfast, we got breakfast, we got brunch, we got lunch, dinner, blupper, and supper. She loves all the meals. <laughs> oh, man, that's great. <laughs> I've had some people tell me, you know, they eat little, you know, three small meals a day. I'm like, well, I eat like six large meals a day, so... <laughs> But I love breakfast. Breakfast is my absolutely favorite meal of the day. I'll go to bed fairly late. I wake up fairly early. And it's just something when I wake up in the morning, it's like during the sleep, I dream about eating breakfast. And when I wake up in the morning, I'm so excited about breakfast. Like it's just anybody with me on breakfast, like breakfast is your thing. Okay, three of us. Awesome. But I'm a breakfast lover. I'm just saying, if you want to know the way to my heart, breakfast. And I love that I have a wife. Where, where'd she go? Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. You know, she'd be, she be mixing up. Sometimes she'd be going to the wrong spot. Uh, <laughs> uh, sometimes she says here. Sometimes she says there. I, it's hard to tell. Hey, I like your dress, girl. Hey. Uh, uh -huh. I, got that, I got her that dress for her uh, 21st birthday. Is that right? Yeah, 21st birthday. Last week, two weeks ago, she had her 21st birthday. <laughs> That's a lie. She 39. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that out loud. Forgive me, Lord. Okay, but anyway, <laughs> yeah, she got, she got, got me an older woman. No, hey, it don't matter. I'm still 38. I'm young. So I tell the kids all the time, I'm like, yeah, go ask your mama. She's a lot older than me. She knows a lot more things of the past than I do. No, a lot more wiser, that's right. Uh, but I love breakfast, and my wife, she loves breakfast too, and so she will cook breakfast in the morning sometimes, but also breakfast for dinner. It's great. If you don't eat breakfast for dinner, you got issues. I'm just telling you. I know some of y'all uppity bougie people, you know, like, mm, breakfast is for breakfast, not for dinner. I imagine, Claudia, do you eat breakfast for dinner? Are you sure? Even as bougie as you are. Ah, we got a good relationship. I'm not picking on somebody I don't know. Love you, Miss Claudia. But the, I love breakfast, and apparently Jesus does too. Because here in John chapter 21, Jesus does this very interesting thing. We've been, for several weeks before Easter, we talked about Easter and how 
uh, death was part of Jesus' story, but it wasn't the end of his story, and that he was a person of the resurrection, and we call ourselves by his name. Therefore, we are Easter people, and we are people of the resurrection, and death may be part of your story, but it's not the end of your story. That there is life to live, and that God wants to give you rich and abundant life in your joy, in your peace, in your happiness, in your righteousness and your holiness. And so we talked about that. And then on Easter Sunday, we dealt with the what's been made available to us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And we talked about his death and how the veil in the temple was torn in two. We discussed how that gave you access, free access to the presence of God and his holiness. There was no veil separating the holy of holies in the temple anymore. But people didn't run to the temple to experience that. Why? Because they were so distracted by the death of Christ, they didn't understand the blessing of it. And so the resurrection opened their eyes to seeing the truth. So we talked about that. And then last week I had uh, four chairs up here, if you remember that. We had the chairs, and we talked about the beauty of the ministry of God's presence, like his availability and him being available to us and sitting with us and resting with us. And we discussed four different, well, actually, I think I did six, but I only had four chairs, and somebody picked on my short little legs, my, my legs didn't ch- stretch all the way to the invisible chairs, and I won't name who that was, but I believe it was Claudia, so, <laughs> so we, we talked about how God takes and gives us the blessing of him spending time with us and meeting us in our brokenness, in our uh, difficulty, in our discouragement, in our hopelessness, and so we, we talked about that through the different various places that God appeared to people after the resurrection. So I want to kind of camp out a little bit with John chapter 21, and then we're going to jump over just a page or two to Acts chapter 1. So you don't have to flip there because, it, again, it's like one page over. You should get there pretty quickly. But John chapter 21, so here's the deal. As we get to verse 15, uh, Peter and some of the disciples, so Peter and I think six other of his friends are fishing now. So Jesus has resurrected from the dead. He has appeared to them occasionally, and they decide, hey, we need to go fishing. So Peter says, I'm going to go fishing, and some of his friends come with him. Six of his friends come, and they're out there fishing. And at this time, especially on the Sea of Galilee, which is where they are, the, the Sea of Galilee, a lot of people fished at night, and especially the professional fishermen, those who this was their profession, their craft. This is what they did for income. They went at night, and they fished all night long, and they hadn't caught anything. Well, then, all of a sudden, in the break of the day, as the daylight is dawning, they're there, and they're, you got to kind of imagine the space that they're in. They fished all night. They're still kind of in this interesting spot of, what, what exactly has happened? What is going on? What about our future with the whole Jesus thing? And still kind of in a little bit of that space. And they fished all night and haven't caught anything. So they're a little bit depleted, a little bit discouraged, tired. How many of you have been up all night before? Right? And you get tired. Kevin's been up a long time for this youth thing. Last night I looked at him and he's like, I mean, he had the big frog eyes because he's tired. And so sometimes when you get tired, It's just, it does something to you. And so that's the place that these disciples find themselves. And then all of a sudden, some joker on the beach, they're about 100 yards away, some joker shows up on the beach. And they don't know who he is at first. And he calls out to them and says, hey, have you caught any fish? And they're like, I bet this guy would. We've been fishing all night. Imagine where they are. I mean, we've been fishing all night. And whoever this joker is on the beach telling us, did you catch any fish? Like, they don't, I'm about to bust them, right? And then, I mean, it's, it's in the text. And then what happens is something really interesting. He goes, hey, now we know because we know the story that it's Jesus. They don't realize it's Jesus yet. And about 100 yards away, it's kind of darkish, and daylight's just starting to break, and they can't quite see him, but he calls out and says, fish on the other side. Like, put your net on the other side. And then they do this. But I imagine as they were doing this, some of them probably thought, I don't know who this guy think he is. But they, they, they obey it even before they realize it's Jesus. They put their net on the other side, and then all of a sudden, 153 large fish get in their net. So they fished for probably eight hours, caught zero, 
Jesus shows up in eight seconds. He does more than they could do in eight hours. And what's really interesting here is this one guy who you know named Thomas goes, Thomas and and John, a couple of them realize, hey, that's Jesus. And when they realize it's Christ, all of a sudden Peter, who had stripped for work, the scripture says. Now, don't use this word stripped as some big, you know, oh, he was out there fishing naked. No, he basically had, you know, if you're going fishing, you're not going to show up in your three-piece suit. If you're going fishing, you're going to be out there, and it's, and it's kind of warm. You're going to be out there, and you got your, your swim trunks on, or you, all you fancy fishermen, you got your PFG stuff, and, you, you know, you got your little fishing shirt with the little thing you can hook here. You got your hat and your whatever them shoes are, uh, hey do, Sanuku, whatever, I, all this stuff, right? I don't even know what kind of stuff fishing people wear because fishing to me is dumb. Um, I'm just, I love fishing for people, but not so much for fish. I'm like, you know, I got to sit here and that thing running around in the pond. Yeah, yeah, he's, I just, the only reason I'm going to fish is because my kids want to fish. I got, my kids the other day were talking about, mm, we need to go fish. So you need to ask your mom because I ain't going. No, I didn't, I didn't say that. I will fish with my kids, but, you know, I'm not. So I did. We got, we got a pond in my neighborhood that the, the wonderful family lives there has said that my kids can fish there. So my kids have already asked like 972 times in the last two days, Daddy, when we going fishing. So. I will take them fishing. Yeah, Laura, go ahead and get the pole. Uh, so they're there and they're fishing. And they, I don't even know where I'm at right now. But they get these 153 large fish. Peter has stripped for work, which means he did not strip butt neck. He obviously had, you know, his kind of undergarments, his board shorts on, and his hey dudes. And when he realizes that it's Jesus, he does something that's interesting is he puts his clothes back on, like his normal outer cloak he puts it back on he might be saying well, why in the world would he if he's getting ready to swim why wouldn't he stay in basically his swim clothes why would he put on his cloak that's because he understood that now it was Jesus and when you appear to a rabbi it was irreverent and disrespectful for you to, to appear to them in not an undressed manner not necessarily just meaning naked but in a sense where you didn't have your best on so Peter puts on his outer cloak knowing that he's getting ready to be in the presence of God, and so he prepares himself for it. He jumps in the water and swims. I don't know what kind of stroke it was. Maybe it was freestyle. Oh, yeah, look at that. Uh, uh, <laughs> that's like the, that's the ice cream truck music. Uh, but it, it, maybe it's freestyle at first. Maybe it's frog stroke. I don't know. What is this? Breaststroke? That's breaststroke, right? Uh, maybe it's that. Maybe it's backstroke. I have no idea, but he gets to... Jesus comes out of the water, and then Jesus has something crazy prepared. Jesus cooked breakfast on the beach. That's pretty awesome, right? So Jesus is there, and Peter comes out of the water, and he smells something. He's like, ah, breakfast. So Jesus has prepared fish and bread on the beach. Pretty awesome. And so then what happens is more of the disciples get to the water because the net was so full that Peter just left him to do the work. And there, because he wanted to be with Jesus, and so they're pulling in the net, and the net had not torn. And when it gets to the shore, Jesus asks for some more fish, and then Peter goes over there, grabs the net of 153 fish, which most theologians would say is probably somewhere, based on where they are, a little over 300 pounds. Uh, As far as what's in the net, he goes and grabs the fish and the net and brings it to over there where Christ is, gets it to the shore, and then gives Jesus some fish. And then that's kind of where we're going to pick up. They've eaten the breakfast, and by the time you get to verse 15, Jesus is getting ready to have this conversation with Peter. Now, don't forget who Peter is. All right? Contextually, you got to remember who Peter is. Peter's the guy that said he would not deny Jesus, but he basically says earlier in the Gospels that he loves Jesus more than all the other disciples. Because Jesus was talking about how all the disciples, when he gets crucified, when he gets betrayed and handed over, that all the disciples would run from him. And Peter says, nope, even if they do, I will not. He's saying, like, look, I love you, Jesus, more than all of them. They may run, but your boy is staying strong. And then Jesus looks at Peter and says, I, actually, here's what's going to happen. See, by the time that the rooster crows or the chicken or whatever crows, you know, you're going to, You're going to deny me three times that you even know me. And so now after this scenario of 
Peter, believing that he is going to be stronger than all the other disciples, Peter denies Jesus three times. And then now Peter and Jesus have this breakfast on the beach. And Jesus is talking with him. And then let's pick up in verse 15. Verse 15, here it says, After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Now, that, that whole phrase there, do you love me more than these, in some, most historians and theologians believe that he is referencing, do you love me more than these, asking Peter, do you love me more than these other disciples, these other people that are with you? Some theologians go the route of, do you love me more than like the boat and the net and the fish? Like, do you love me more than these tangible blessings in your life? Do you love me more than your car, your boat, your truck, your family, that kind of stuff? But most, the, the kind of general thought process is that Jesus is piggybacking off of the declaration that Peter made earlier in the Gospels that he, even if every disciple would betray him, that he would not. And he's going to you, piggyback off that in order to try to reconfirm or reaffirm Peter's character. So it's, yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Verse 16, Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked a question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you, Jesus said. Then feed my sheep. And we'll get to verse 18 in just a second. Let's talk about why Jesus would ask this question three times. And we're going somewhere here. It's going gonna, it's gonna to connect at the end. But why would Jesus ask this question three times? Remember that Peter declared that no matter what anyone else did, that he would not deny the Lord. Everybody else could run. Everybody else can hide. Everybody else can get fearful. But Peter said he would not. That He would stay when everybody else left. But in fact, he did exactly what Jesus predicted he would do, and he denied him three times and ran away. So this time of Jesus asking Peter three times, do you love me, is, is very interesting when you pay attention to the language and the beauty of the way that Jesus is asking and the words at which he's using to ask the question. If you don't just look on the surface, but you take time to really focus on the individual words, you'll see what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is literally trying to take Peter's mind back to his false declaration that he would never deny him and bring it here in order to reaffirm and to rehab Peter's character, to restore Peter's purpose and to restore Peter's apostleship or his leadership within the church that it's about to start that Peter doesn't even know about yet. So what's interesting is that Jesus uses the word, when Jesus says, do you love me? He uses a word that we would understand as the word agape, which is an unconditional love. In the Greek language, this, this word is basically saying it's a love that has no limit. It is an unconditional, forgiving, gracious type of love. So he asked Peter, do you love me? And he asked Peter, basically, do you agape me? Do you unconditionally love me? Are you willing to run through hell for the case of, and cause of Christ? Peter responds, yes, I love you, but he doesn't respond with agape. He responds with the word phileo. This is a brotherly or friendly type of love. So when Peter, when Jesus goes, do you love me? He's saying like, do, are you ready to run through hell with me? Are you, is your love for me limitless? Is there nothing that can stop what I'm calling you to do? And Peter's response is, yes, Lord, I phileo you, which means I am a friend of yours. I am friendly with you. We get our English word or your English, the English city, Philadelphia from this word. It's the city of brotherly love. That is from the Greek. And this idea, this phileo. So Jesus asked him, hey, do you agape me? Do you unconditionally love me? And Peter's response is, I love you like a friend. So Jesus is trying to do something here. It isn't like Jesus is being disrespectful that he would ask the question three times. He's trying to take Peter to a new place. 
He's trying to get the posture of his heart to a different spot. And sometimes we can feel like God is somehow disrespectful if he keeps bringing up something over and over. He keeps the same thing on your spirit, the same thing on your heart. He keeps you wake up in the morning, you're thinking about the same verse again. It isn't because Jesus has forgotten that he already showed you that. It's because he knows some place you need to go and a posture of heart you need to get to, and he keeps the same thing in front of you so that he can take you there. So Jesus asked this question three times. Also pay attention to the language. It says, then feed my lambs. A lamb is what? A young sheep. And then you got sheep. And then you got sheep again. And watch, it says, feed my lambs, then take care of my sheep, and then feed my sheep. We know scripturally and theologically that the people of God are symbolically referred to as sheep. And so he is getting somewhere here. He's trying to help Peter understand. Remember, Peter has denied Jesus three times. And now Jesus asked him this question three times. And Peter isn't really answering the question in the way that Jesus wants him to. And so he's asking again and again and again. And then all of a sudden, Peter kind of gets it because then at the end he says, Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Basically, take care of my people. He is with that statement, feed my sheep. He is restoring. He's letting Peter know, hey, I understand what has happened. I understand that you denied me three different times. I know you said you wouldn't, and you did. I know you said you you would prosper, but you failed. But guess what? I'm ready to restore your position. I'm ready to bring you back. You are an apostle. Feed my sheep. So Peter and Jesus are having this conversation. And then Jesus says something that's kind of like a mic drop. He says, I tell you the truth. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you, take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to let him know what kind of death would glorify God. Then Jesus told him, follow me. Then Jesus told him, follow me. Now, I love this next part. Because Jesus is so, so good, but also so, so gangster, okay? Uh, I mean, that's a Madhu quote, but I'm telling you, this is like Jesus has this to be awesome and lovely and gracious, but also his tongue can be a little bit pointed at the same time. Uh, Here it goes. It says, then, so Jesus told him, follow me, because he's he's showing him what kind of death, that he's going to have to die by crucifixion. He's going to have to die by being on a cross like Christ did. And uh, if you don't know, later, there's a lot of historians and theological uh, people that would say that, hey, when Peter, Peter died on a cross, but when Peter was put to death, that he asked to be turned upside down because he didn't see himself as worthy to die in the same manner as Christ. So instead of dying upright on a cross, that he was, he was basically, he killed upside down on a cross. And look at this. So Jesus says, Jesus told him, follow me. Peter turned around and saw behind them the disciple that Jesus loved, which is John. And if if I'm writing a book, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to let you know that's me too, right? If you're you're writing a gospel and you're talking about your eyewitness account, of course, I'm going to refer to myself as the one that Jesus loved. I mean, like, he loves you a little bit, but he loves me, right? So turns around, and he sees the one that Jesus loved, John, the one who leaned over to Jesus during the supper and asked, Lord, who will betray you? Peter asked Jesus, what about him, Lord? And then this is where Jesus is a little gangster, Kevin. Jesus replied, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is it to you? As for you, follow me. So now this story got good, okay? I'm a little bit of a biblical nerd. I love this kind of back and forth in the text. And so I get excited about it. You see my veins, they popping out. Woo! I'm about to have it. Okay. I, I, I love this story, man. It's awesome. So Jesus, death, burial, resurrection, comes back from the dead, appears to his disciples, appears to the brokenhearted. And I love this appearance that he shows up for breakfast on the beach and his 
goal here is not to just provide for them in a physical hunger, but he needs to restore or satisfy the spiritual hunger that has been stirred up inside of Peter based on his denial. And so Jesus feeds them breakfast on the beach, and they have a wonderful time, kumbaya, look at the sun, look at the moon, and all this stuff, the moon ain't out, I guess, but, you know, look at all this, look at the waves, isn't this awesome, we're hanging out on the beach, and then Jesus, the text leads us to believe that Jesus and Peter kind of took a little walk, and they are stepped away from the crowd just a little bit, and then Jesus knows, all right, this is my time to speak into the heart of Peter, and ask him, do you love me? It's my time to restore him. It's my time to reaffirm the calling on his life. Remember, there was an earlier conversation where on the confession of Peter that the Lord would build the church. So now Jesus is reaffirming that. Jesus can't be a liar because it's not in his ability or his character to do so. So Jesus couldn't have said, hey, Peter, upon your confession of faith, I will build the church, but then not speak into Peter's denial of the confession. So he now speaks to Peter three different times and asks him, hey, do you agape me? Peter, I phileo you, homie. No, do you agape? And then Jesus goes, hey, look, I need you to feed my sheep restoring Peter, saying, hey, I know that you think because of your sin that your position in the kingdom of God has been wiped away, but I'm here today to let you know I'm restoring that position. I'm reaffirming you. I'm placing you back in the place that I told you you would be because your issues and your failure do not speak louder than the grace of God and his purpose for you. And so he speaks that over his life and then goes, listen, I need you to follow me. This word follow in the Greek is a word called aklatheo. And this aklatheo is, it gets its, uh, the word is from the root word in Greek that means road. And so what he's telling him is, listen, Peter, I know what you've done, but I need you to take heart because I'm restoring you. And now I want you to travel my road. I want you to follow me. I want you to get on the road with me. Now, you got to think about the road that Jesus travels. It's the road of sacrifice. It's the road of heartache. It's the road of torture. It's the the road of persecution. It's the road of grace. It's the road of getting around uncomfortable people. It's the road of being mocked. It's the road of being ridiculed. But it's also the road of service. It's the road of humility. And so Jesus, in spite of what Peter has done, looks at Peter and says, hey, as for you, I need you to follow me. I need you to aklatheo me. I need you to get on my road. And then Peter goes, <clears throat> because Jesus lets him know, like, my road for you means death. The invitation to follow Jesus was an invitation to die, but it was also an invitation to live. And so Jesus looks at him and says, hey, follow me, <laughs> and tells him he's going to die. And then Peter's like, yeah, about that. <clears throat> what about him? Is he going to die too? Because what I want to do is take just a moment, and I want to talk about three different things that preoccupy our hearts from following God's road for our life. If if you're tracking with this text, there are three things that you'll see in this text that preoccupy your heart and your mind from following the Lord. Because Jesus looks at Peter and says, if he, if I want to keep him around until I come back from heaven, What's it to you? As for you, follow me. The first thing, because the same invitation that he's giving Peter, he's giving us. He's looking at you and saying, hey, Claudia, follow me. Follow me. Like, get on my road. He's saying, Tammy, follow me. Laura, follow me. Chris, follow me. Jesus did not just come from the peace of heaven to the hell of this earth to die for you and to rise from the dead. That's a piece of it. But he came to give you an invitation to live and an invitation to die, to die to yourself. He came to get you on his road. He came to look at you and said, follow me, 
follow me. Follow me. Be where I'm going to be. Do what I'm going to do. Speak like I'm going to speak. Think like I think. Get on my level. He's telling Peter that, and he's telling each one of us that. If you want some casual, soft-hearted Christianity, that is not the message of Jesus. Jesus' invitation to you and I isn't go to church each week and feel good about yourself. No, it's an invitation to die. It's an invitation to take up your own cross, deny yourself, and follow Jesus. When you follow Christ, you are committing to him that I'm willing to die for you. I'm willing for my pride to die. I'm willing for my jealousy to die. I'm willing for my greed to die. I'm willing for that that attraction to lust. I'm willing for it to die. That is, the invitation is follow me. Follow me. And three things typically preoccupy our hearts from truly following God's plan. The first one is comparison. You you know that Jesus loves you. You know that Jesus came from heaven to earth to not just die for you, but to die as you. That he literally took the past, present, and future sin and shame of every single one of us and let it be placed on his soul at one single moment and allowed that to take his life. The Roman soldiers didn't kill Jesus. Your sin did. And so he's there. And our sin crushes him, but only for a time. He was in control the entire time. And then he dies, resurrects from the dead. And he tells you, look, I got a plan for your life. A plan to save you, but also a plan to send you. Because it wasn't enough for Jesus just to save Peter. He also wanted to send Peter. He wanted to send Peter out in Acts chapter 1, which we're going to get to. The goal here was, hey, I know what you've done, but I know where I'm taking you. And Peter's first thing, his first thought after Jesus says, follow me, is what about him? Isn't that what we do a lot? God gives us this plan. God's like, hey, I love you. I got a plan and a purpose for your life. And you don't understand it all yet, but listen, I got something for you. And we're ready. Okay, God, send me, but then... What about him? Why are you blessing that church more than this church? Why does that person not live as holy as I do, but yet seems to have more than I do? What? Don't act like y'all super holy. I might be the only one messed up in the crowd, but I'm going to be honest with you. I know Jesus saved me. I know that Jesus has victory over death, hell, and the grave. I know that Jesus looks at me and says, hey, listen, Scooter, follow me. It's an invitation to die to myself. It's also an invitation to live. That rich, abundant life that we've been talking about from John chapter 10, verse 10. But sometimes when I feel like I'm trying to walk out and get on God's road and I'm trying to follow him, something that preoccupies my mind is comparison. What about them? You're calling me to deny myself. Are you calling them to do it too? Well, why are they more blessed? Why are they less blessed? Why am I this? And you start looking, you start comparing. Be careful. Be careful. Because comparison is a trap that will stop you from walking the road that Jesus died to give you. Peter's response is, what about him? His mind wasn't on the path that Christ was calling him. His mind was on comparison. Were you going to kill him too, Jesus? Or just me? He's comparing stories. The road to travel for each one of us is similar but also different. Some of us he may bless more financially than others. Some of us he may bless more in a joyful way than others. Some of us, he may give, he may bless you in a way where you can have a big, bigger family than others. At the end of the day, God knows the plan and purpose for your life. You can't get so preoccupied in your mind on why he's doing something in someone else's life and not doing it in yours. God didn't call Peter to walk John's road. He called Peter to walk his road. So we have to be careful that when we're following Christ that we don't become, our hearts don't become preoccupied with comparison. The second is, uh, remember Peter's story. 
Peter's story is that he said, I'm going to die with you, Jesus. If everybody else denies you, your boy will not. I am tough. I am strong. You know the stuff you teach your kids to say, right? I imagine he's over there repeating, I am brave. I am beautiful. I am, well, probably not that, but, you know, <laughs> he's over there, and he's, like, coaching himself, and he's not going to deny Jesus until all of a sudden some woman by the fire goes, and some girl goes, I think I know you. You're one of he. Oh, no, I don't know that man. I don't know him. When you think about times in your life when you knew that you were supposed to make a decision to honor God and you chose to make the opposite decision and you knew you were making it. Remember how heavy that is? He's made that decision not that long ago. That decision for Paul or for Peter to deny Jesus wasn't that long ago in the text, in the story. And so as he's thinking about the weight of the decision. When Jesus says, follow me, it had to cross his mind, his failures and his insecurities. So that's another thing that preoccupies our hearts sometimes and will stop us from walking God's calling or God's purpose for our life is one, comparison, the trap of comparison and the the trap of your past. And you can kind of clump this up into your failures, your insecurities. How many times has God said, I need you to do this, or I want to track you this way? And you've already, in your your mind, you've pulled a Saul, a King Saul from the Old Testament. You pulled a Gideon from the Old Testament. You're like, wait a second, how how can, how, uh, you know, Jesus, you don't know what you're talking about because uh, my family's the weakest, and my family's this, and I'm, I'm from the smallest clan, and I don't this, and I'm not that. And isn't that what we do? We let our past and our failures speak up, and we let our hearts be preoccupied by where we haven't measured up, and we forget that Christ has measured up for us. So the truth of the matter is that Peter's mind is being told, like, hey, I need you to follow me, and then his response is, what about him? Comparison is the natural slant. And then maybe he's thinking about his failures where he didn't measure up. God, I I know you're calling me to follow you, but I'm really not worthy of following you because I remember what it was like that night when I told you I wouldn't deny you, but I did three different times. So maybe you can choose him or somebody else, but I'm not so sure I can do it. So we get preoccupied by comparison and preoccupied by our failures and our insecurities. And then the third thing and last thing that we get preoccupied by is the uncertainty of the future. You'll notice that Jesus does something interesting here. He kind of comes in and tells Peter a little bit of the story of what's going to happen in the future, but doesn't lay it all out. And some of us want, okay, Jesus, I will follow you if you tell me parts A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way to Z, I will follow you. That don't take faith. That's living by sight, not by faith. Scripture says we live by faith not by sight. So Jesus will paint a little of the picture. He might give you a little bit of the outline, but you don't usually see kind of the beauty of the painting until you take some steps into the future. And so Jesus is telling him, follow me, and what happens? He gives him a little bit of the future. And you got to think in his, Peter's mind, he's like, yeah, I'm not so sure about this. Like dying? And, you know, and uh, just, I don't know, Jesus. The uncertainty of the future. I mean, today, I want all of us in this room to not pretend that we are stronger or more mature than we are. Let's be honest and transparent before the Lord. There's some uncertainty and some pain and fear that comes with uncertainty of the future. You're starting to think about the future and what the future will hold and if you can provide and if you can do this and if you can do that. And you get a little bit sometimes restricted. It feels like the future and the uncertainty of it is like a straitjacket. So what we see in this text is, is some very interesting stuff. We see Jesus giving Peter a call to follow him. Peter's mind is preoccupied by three things. His mind is preoccupied by comparison. 
His mind is preoccupied by failures and insecurities, and his mind is preoccupied by the uncertainty or fear of the future. Isn't that so natural? Aren't you grateful that the Bible is relatable? Because y'all in this room, y'all look really, really good. I'm telling you, I see your dresses. I see you, you guys with your college shirts on. You guys look awesome today. You really do. You look so dapper and dandy and wonderful and pretty and all and beautiful. But listen, the, the, the text here is that inside there is a filth in every one of us that is preoccupied with comparison preoccupied with insecurities and our shame from our past and preoccupied with the uncertainty and fear of the future that makes us feel as if somehow we can't actually follow Jesus in the way he's calling us to. If you want an invitation to follow something flimsy and half-hearted, then just follow yourself. But if you want an invitation to follow a giant slayer, if you want an invitation to follow a holy God who is perfect, that creates galaxies from just words, that basically spits out Milky Ways, that can slay everything that you'll ever face. If you want an invitation to follow someone like that, then that is an invitation that Jesus looks at you and says, hey, follow me. I know where you've been. I know what you've done. And I know what your mind is preoccupied with. But your fear of the future doesn't undo what I'm calling you to do and where I'm calling you to go. Hey, I understand that I give you something and all of a sudden you're trying to compare what it is to somebody else. But that's not apples to apples because I've called you to walk a certain road that I haven't called them to walk. Today, every single one of us, Jesus is looking at you and say, follow me. In the Christian church today, in the Americanized, soft, little mushy Christian church. We got to get out of this idea that Jesus is just somebody that is good, that came to make us good. He didn't come to make you good. He came to make you alive and put you on a road of death and life. That is the invitation to follow him. If your faith in Christ hasn't cost you anything, then you may not have real faith in Christ. If your faith in Jesus has never cost you a friend, it may not be a real faith. Or it might be that you just pigeonhole yourself against, around just Christian people and you've only trying to shine the light in the light. But for the light to shine the brightest, it needs to be in the dark. There is an invitation to follow Jesus and it is not some little mamsy pamsy journey. It's an invitation to die and an invitation to live. Jesus looks at you today and says, hey, do you love me? And our response is, yeah, friend, I love you. And I think it's great that Scripture calls us a friend of God. But a friend shouldn't be all that you are. So my question now as I get ready to close, which means what? Thank you. <laughs> you see that countdown at the back? <laughs> Yeah, they think I'm actually going to pay attention to that. Um, <laughs> I got two minutes to finish preaching. So here we go. Don't look at that ever again. Don't turn around. Okay. I should have never put your attention on that. Jake, right? I should have never said that, Jake. So my question is this, because I, I never want to just educate you and unpack the scriptures. and so Because I believe a good message is educational inspirational, but also applicable. It's got to be something where you can take some handles and apply to our daily life. So right now, I think we've gotten to a place where we understood kind of the, the knowledge of the text. We've educated ourselves. We know some of the original language. We know the context and where it is and what's going on. I believe that there's been some inspiration in the text. It's calling us. There's like it's trying to wake up the lion inside of us to get us to rise up and live the road that God has called in spite of comparison, in spite of our fear of this, the future, in spite of our shame and insecurities and our failures, right? God is saying, in spite of all that, I can restore you, just like he did with Peter. Hey, I know what you've done, but you feed my sheep. I'm restoring your apostleship. So he's doing the same today. He's restoring us. He's calling you to follow him. Now, if you think about Peter... The Peter that you know from the New Testament, the book of Acts, is not necessarily the Peter you know from the Gospels. 
that Peter, you know, from the Gospels is a little bit kind of crazy and wild and just a little bit hard to predict and a little bit half there sometimes. He's just, yeah, he got kind of crazy, kind of hot-headed, cutting people, you know, ears off and he's just doing some crazy stuff. And the Peter you see in the book of Acts is very different. And so... I believe that there was some things that Peter applied to his personal life that took him from this person in John 21 that was kind of overwhelmed or preoccupied with comparison, failure, insecurity, and fear of the, the future to this bold man of God that is at the point of taking the gospel to the rest of the world. What's the difference? So if we walk through Acts chapter 1, for Tom's sake, I won't read the whole chapter. I will read several, several verses of it, though. And I believe these verses kind of unpack some things that Peter applied to his personal life that kind of woke up that line inside of him so that he could be ready to follow Jesus on the road that Jesus was calling him to follow, which was a road ultimately to his upside-down crucifixion. Let's, let's look at the first. It says, uh, after the ascension, so in Acts chapter 1, there's the promise of the Holy Spirit in verses 1 through 5. Then in verses 6 through 11, there is the ascension of Christ, and the disciples are kind of there as Jesus ascends back into heaven and looks and is kind of trying to figure out, we're just trying to figure out what's going on. And then an angel appears and says, look, he's going to heaven. You can't see him anymore right now, but he's going to come back. In verse 12, let's pick up there. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, a distance of half a mile. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room of the house where they were staying. Here are the names of those who were present. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, oh, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James, because they don't want you to be confused. It ain't the other one, okay? That one has passed away. Verse 14, they all met together and were constantly united in prayer, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. So let's just be honest here. Look at the text. If you're looking for some things that Peter and the disciples apply to their daily life, that helped that line wake up on the inside, that gave them the courage to surrender and pick up their cross. The first one is, it says, they met, they all met together. They were together. Peter doesn't get this uh, reaffirmation from Christ and this restoration from Christ and then alienate himself or isolate himself from the rest of the group. It says they were together. If you're ever going to walk the path that God has for your life, a path to die, a path to deny your flesh, a path to say no to things you really want, but say yes to things you don't quite want yet that God is calling you to. If you're ever going to walk the road, follow him. If you're ever going to aklathia, if you're ever going to follow the road of Christ, destined by Christ for your life, you can't do it alone. You have to be together. You got to have some accountability in your life. You got to have some people that are walking life with you. I love you. I am trying to be an encourager. It is one of our pillars right there. You can see on the banner that it, our goal is to encourage. And so please, I want to say this as an encouragement. If the only time that we see you at this church is on Sunday or the only time that anybody in this church ever hears from you is on Sunday, there needs to be a change. I know you got busy lives. I do too. I'm not telling you to be here every time the doors are open. I'm not even saying, hey, make it to another service other than Sunday. But there needs to be some people from the family of God that you are attached to that you're together with, so they can support you and you can support them. You will fall flat on your face if you're trying to go this journey alone. They were together. 
Peter gets this calling on his life. It had to scare. I mean, I, 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 the word I want to say is probably out of context, so I'm not going to say it, but it, let's just use another word. This had to scare the heck out of Peter. They did not, I mean, if unless he is just totally different than you and I. I mean, it had to scare the bejeebies out of him. Like, follow me. He know where Jesus went. He know Jesus, death, hell, and the grave. He know that Jesus had been spit on, ridiculed, laughed at, stabbed, and murdered. And then Jesus said, follow me. Akalatheo, like, walk my road for you. If I'm Peter, I'm like, ooh, mm, anything else, Lord, please, anything. He said, follow me. It was an invitation to die and an invitation to live. And so Peter had to be afraid. He had to, these comparison and this, these different things that we've talked about had to be kind of rising up in his humanness. And I love that he didn't isolate by the weight of the calling on his life. He didn't go, I feel the weight of this call, and so I don't know how to handle the weight of it by myself, so I'm just going to be by myself. I don't know how, and he doesn't do that. He doesn't isolate and alienate. He gets with people, and it says they were together. If you're going to walk out the calling on your life, you must be together. Together. I love right after that. It says they were together, and they were constantly united. It's one thing just to be together. It's another thing to be together in unity. To say, hey, you might vote a little different than me sometimes. You might dress a little bit different than me sometimes, but we're not going to overemphasize the minors and underemphasize the majors. The major is that you and I have both been called by the grace of Jesus Christ, and we are his people, and we can celebrate grace and also celebrate our differences at the same time. They was, there was a unity about them. Some of them used to be fishermen. Some of them used to be tax collectors. Some of them were saved out of one thing, and some of them were saved out of another thing. Some of them probably like this person. Some of them like that person. Some of them like to wear that robe. Some of them thought that robe was dumb. They wanted this robe. But it didn't matter because they were together and they were unified. There was unity. And it says united in prayer. So Peter made some decisions. One decision was together. I can't bear this weight alone. I can't walk this road by myself. I need to be together with people. But I also need to humble myself and walk this road in unity. Celebrating the things that matter and not really overemphasizing the things that don't. Too many people in churches today make mountains out of molehills. And since they were united in prayer, prayer is an invitation not just for you to talk to God, but also for God to talk to you. And I believe that Peter becomes a man that has a certain courageous spirit about him because not only is he together with unity, but he was surrendered and united in prayer. He kept putting himself, the people, the men of God, kept putting themselves in the presence of God. Through prayer. There's power in prayer. There's power in sitting down and shutting up. There is. There's power in sitting down and putting your phone down and on silent and saying, God, I believe you're worth being with. So here I am. I believe you're worth airplane mode. So boop. I believe you're worth putting my phone in the bathroom and shutting the door and me getting in my prayer closet and just speaking to you and giving you time to speak to me. I believe prayer is so powerful. Prayer is one of those things that's like taboo, and it seems like a waste of time that you can never get out of it what somebody else gets out of it, and you can never give to it what somebody else gives to it because the devil wants to stop you from doing it, so he's going to try to make you feel insecure. And it's gonna, I'll be honest with you. The first couple times you try to do closet prayer, it's probably going to suck. Be honest. I don't know if a pastor say that. Forgive me. But, but it's the truth, like, the first few times, it's, you're going to feel like your prayers maybe just boom, boom and hit you back in the face. But life change doesn't happen by what you do occasionally. It happens by what you do consistently. It's just putting yourself back in the presence of God, putting yourself back in the presence of God, back in the presence of God, 
back in the presence of God. Jesus tells the people, tells these disciples, he says, listen, I need you to go to Galilee. I need you to go there and wait. Don't leave the town yet because I'm going to send an advocate for you. So the next thing that I noticed that they do is they were willing to wait on the Lord. So here's this hot-headed punk named Peter that stands up in his pride and, and is willing to cut people's ears off and willing to say, I'm never going to deny Jesus, but then denies him three times. Being Jesus in his beautiful presence meets with Peter, restores him, calls him out on a beautiful path of life and death for his future. Peter's preoccupied with fear of uncertainty of the future. He's preoccupied with many different things and comparison and his failures and his insecurities from his past. And then the beautiful part is that Jesus restores them anyway. And then you watch as this man that was just a shell of himself in John 21 now becomes a bold man of God. And he walks the path. He truly, akalathio, he follows Jesus, follows Jesus, and the things that he had to apply to his life to become that type of man. He had to be together. He had to have some accountability. He had to have a crew. He had to have some people that could walk life with him. They couldn't be just connected by a row of chairs on a Sunday. They had to have hearts that were intermingled and connected Monday through Sunday. And then there was this idea of unity and committing themselves to prayer, making a decision to wait on the Lord. I mean, how crazy is it? Think about the text. How crazy is it to be told by Jesus once he gets out of the, you know, goes into the sky and gets out of the earth, so to speak, to wait. And you're thinking, what am I waiting on? I mean, I got stuff to do and places to go. And, and he says, wait. And Peter was willing to do what Jesus said and wait on the Lord. Too many of us don't walk out the path that God has for our life because we're too forceful and we want to go ahead and solve everything now. And we we don't want to wait on the Lord. We don't want to even wait on us, and so we just start forcing stuff. They were willing to wait on the Lord. Then, for time's sake, I got to really finish, but a couple of things else in the text here that Peter does something, he brings up scripture from the Old Testament in the book of Psalms, and he takes that scripture and says, hey, this is true of what just happened. Judas was taken, and now we have to, the scripture tells us to get somebody to replace him. He's walking, he's viewing life through perspective of scripture, and he's willing to obey scripture. You see the text? Look at me. I understand that th- this is, is a lot of context and a lot of just different biblical things today. But please understand this. The call of Jesus on your life is never for you just to become a good person. The call of Jesus on your life isn't for you to live feeling good about yourself because somehow in, in a miracle, miraculous state, you've, you've got to escape the punishment of shame and hell. That's not just the call of Jesus on your life. I mean, the call of Jesus on your life is an invitation to die. And so he reaffirms Peter. He looks at him and says, hey, do you love me? And he's trying to take him somewhere. He's trying to take this heart that is preoccupied with so many different things comparison and shame and regret and the fear of the uncertain future. And he's trying to take all of those things and rip the heart out of that and put it on a place that God has destined him to be. The same thing is true of you today. I don't care where you've been or what you've said or what you've done. Neither does Jesus. He looks at you and he wants to reaffirm his love for you. He looks at you and wants to offer you grace and mercy and new beginnings. But it's never just for you. He never saves you and appears to you and ministers to you just to do that. It's more than just blessing you. He, in fact, wants to take the blessing he put on your life and now let blessing funnel through you and put you on a path to death. 
dead to your flesh, dead to your greed, dead to your sinful thoughts, dead to your desires. God is calling you to death. This isn't a popular message. This isn't the flimsy message that will be preached around thousands of churches today. This is a message not to just live, but a message to die. As a church, we have to be willing to say, Jesus, you've done so much for me. I don't care if you ever give me another thing. Because you die for me, you beat death, hell, and the grave. I get spiritual salvation, but also, Jesus, you walk through the Holy Spirit. You walk in life with me. You comfort me. You guide me. And if you never do another daggone thing for me, I am going to take my life and I'm going to aclatheo you. I'm going to put it on the road of Christ. And you call me to die, I'm willing to die. You call me to deny myself, I'm willing to deny myself. You call me to, to take the greed and the shame that's my sin slant, that's been plaguing me my whole life. You call me to let that die, so I'm willing to let it die. This is hard preaching, but it's needed preaching. It's time that the church today wakes up. Jesus didn't come to just make you feel good about yourself. He came to take somebody who was dead, make them alive, but then also make them someone who is a conduit of life for other people. That you are now called to to walk a road of death and life and point people to the beauty of Jesus. And it probably won't happen because you'll shrink in your fear if you're not together with some people in life. If you don't have a church that can support you and a vision group that you walk hand in hand with. I saw Kevin do an awesome illustration last night where he brought up a group of people and they locked arms. And he was saying, hey, I'm locked in. We're all locked in together. And for time's sake, I can't do it because I'm a long-winded preacher. But they did this and it was like, hey, we're together. We can face things because we're together. So you can walk the path that God has for you if you're together. And there's unity. And if you understand the power of prayer and that you're willing just to continue just to commit yourself to it, even when it seems like it doesn't work, just keep committing yourself to it. And then be willing to wait on the Lord. So what if what you want to happen hasn't happened yet? You keep knocking. You keep seeking. You keep praying. You keep believing. And you don't force things. You wait. On the Lord. Work on obeying the scriptures. Like Peter. The scriptures are the lens at which he's viewing. The circumstance he's in. And then you can't. Underemphasize the role of the Holy Spirit here. That the Holy Spirit comes onto the believers. And the same coward that was in. The Gospels, now all of a sudden, you see this man be a mighty man of God. And he walks out that invitation to follow Jesus. My prayer is this. My prayer is that over the next few days, that the weightiness and the meat of this sermon would sit with you. That you, the Holy Spirit, would just help it just continue to marinate. And that you would just keep picking it apart and you would keep thinking about it. And you would keep uh, just going to it and asking the Lord to give you some clarity for it. But please look at me. The invitation for Christ is an invitation to die. It's an invitation to die. I've never met too many things than when it was their time of death. That they just wanted to die. Most of the time, they want to keep living. So guess what? There's some stuff within you that Jesus is calling you to walk and let it die. But that thing rises up inside of you. And guess what? That greed wants to keep living. So it's going to fight you. That addiction to pornography wants to keep living. So it's going to fight you. When you try to put it to death. An invitation to follow Christ is an invitation to die to yourself. Your mind will be preoccupied with so many things that will stop you from walking God's path. His road. So you can do yourself a favor and the kingdom of God a favor. 
and the people in your home a favor and dedicate yourself to being together with people who are like-minded, to unity, to prayer, to application of Scripture, and to waiting on the Lord and to guidance to the, of the Holy Spirit. Lord, right now, I pray today, like I did before, that just your message, your word, would not return void. Lord, I know that it doesn't. I have confidence right now that even though it was a long-winded preacher who seemed like he would never be quiet, that the beauty of your word through your Holy Spirit, it produces fruit. So in ways that I can't even imagine, I pray, Lord, that you produce fruit in the lives and the hearts of those who are in the room today and watching online. That this wouldn't be some flimsy message that just connects you, connects us to some spiritual principle. That we would really understand, Jesus, what you're calling us to what you call Peter to, and what you're calling us to. God, you're calling us to follow you, to follow you through hell, to follow you through difficulty, to follow you through insecurity, to follow you through being mocked and ridiculed, to follow you through dying. So, Lord, we look to you today, and I pray you minister to us. And how we apply this message into our life would be how we minister back to you. In just a second, I'm going to ask Ashley if it's totally she's going to kill me for this. But can you come and play some music on the keyboard for me? I'm going to ask Ashley to just play some music on the keyboard. And then this altar call, we're going to do two things. The, if you and your family have sacrificed and focused and prayed on giving to the vision offering, then during this altar call, that's what these buckets are for. I'd love for you and your family to come and and bring that sacrifice to the altar and lay it down before the Lord and pray that the leadership of this church and the pastor and those involved would honor God with that gift and that we would continue to be exactly who God has called us to be. I'll also call you to the altar today to pray and commit yourself to the Lord. I understand that sometimes we can rely so much on a moment of worship and music and that we let that moment propel us and we actually aren't led by the Spirit. Today, I'm not calling you, and Jesus isn't calling you to just feel good about yourself. He's calling you to die. If there's something in your life that needs to die, if there's a path, a dream, a purpose, a, a road that Jesus has called you to follow him on, and you need to kind of recommit yourself to that path, then I'd love for you to come to the altar today and just sit with him, confess it to him. Again, Jesus isn't calling you to just feel good. More than ever before, the heart of the American church has to turn back to Christ, where he is the treasure, where he is the beautiful one. When we're not so much serving our purpose and what we want, but we're focused on the kingdom. So, Lord, today we will answer the call to die. And the call to live. Lord, I believe there's families in the room that need to come to the altar together. 
because you've called their family to follow you. But for whatever reason, the family's gotten a little off track. And we're not here to shame the family. We're not here to beat them down, Lord. But I pray that you give them this moment where they can just step up to you and say, Lord, we confess and we're willing to follow you. We're willing to let our hearts and minds that are so preoccupied with comparison and insecurities and failures and the fear of the future, we're willing to quiet that down and akalatheo you. God, get on your road. I believe there's families that need to come to the altar today together. I believe there's people in the room that you haven't really come to the altar before because you're scared of it. Now's the time to die. Now's the time to take those things inside of you that are fighting for life. They want to live, but they need to die. I'm praying right now that you bring them before the Lord. And he today can heal you. He can restore you. So, Lord, I pray that as we bring our offering to you for vision offering, God, that as we, as this is a sacrifice, because for this vision offering to take place, some other things had to die. We had to say no to things, to say yes to vision offering. So, Lord, as we bring this to you today, we are following your path. So, Lord, we surrender and we give to you. And I pray, Lord, you'll meet us at this altar as we lay ourselves down and we say, God, I'm willing to follow you.
a hope that you always remember. Yes, Jesus called you to live, but he also called you to die. So those who are getting ready to go to college, remember, there's going to be so many things that come your way. There's going to be so many things that want to preoccupy your heart and your mind. So many things that try to infiltrate what Kevin and the the leadership here have done to instill inside of you. So many things that are right in front of you. The same way that God has a plan for you, the devil's got a plan for you. And he wants nothing more than to laugh in Christ's face and feel like he's won by getting your heart. But Jesus came to give you a rich and satisfying life, a life that is abundant. And so there will be things that preoccupy your heart, but the calling on your life isn't to live as the world. The calling on your life is is to die to yourself and let the world see Christ through you. I believe in you. I'm here for you. I know you don't leave for some more months, but I just felt this on my spirit this morning, that the call for all of us is a call to die. Your parents, your kids, your brother, your sister, your spouse, the thing that's going to make a difference in their life is a fully surrendered follower of Jesus that's willing to die with him. I thank you so much for your heart, for the vision offering. The leadership of the church has had to, because I actually think very little of offering and giving and tithing and all that. I know it's biblical. I know it's on. I know it should be this huge focus, but I have a real like strong kind of discipleship heart where I just want people to get closer to the Lord. And I know that giving is a part of that. So thank you so much for your sacrifice for the vision offering. I believe and confident that the Lord is going to use it to help plant and root us in the Lukama area. So thank you. We've already been asked a couple times if you can give to the vision offering after today. And the answer is yes. So on your way out today, uh, well, actually, yeah, we just, we'd love for you to fill this out. Uh, if you would like to, there again, no pressure. It's a pledge card. As we begin to make our way to the banks and financial institutions and stuff and on looking for loans and different stuff to secure property and stuff like that, you know, they, they ask. Just like if you were going to buy a house, they ask, like, what, what do you have to put down? They ask also, well, in a business sense, they say, in a 501c3 sense, they say, hey, do you, what do you have pledged for this cause? So that's what this is. It's a pledge card. You can fill out this part, fill out the big part. The end of it that is a different color is perforated. So you can just want you to fill out that part too. But this is for you to take home with you. So you're going to take this part home. And this is to remind you. It's for you to pray over. It's for you to think about. It's for you to put it somewhere so you see it. And then you keep praying for the vision offering. You keep praying that God would save souls. You keep praying that God would root us and plant us in Lukama. So this is for you, for your records, and for you to hold on to and pray over and keep. And then you give this part back to us. There's this real cool thing on it, and it says, my giving potential. Remember, our, the vision offering is above and beyond what we usually give to the Lord. You guys are a faithful church. I thank you for your giving. But the vision offering is above and beyond that. If you typically give $100 a month to the church, then the vision offering, if you say, hey, I want to give $20 a month for the vision offering, that's on top of what you normally give. 
I just want you to know 100%, the people who are close to me on the leadership team know I am completely 100% uncomfortable talking about this. I hate it. <laughs> I know that right now I'm trying to lean into God and be obedient, uh, but this is very uncomfortable for me. I'll preach to you for three hours about Christ and his goodness, but it's hard for me to stammer through five minutes on giving, like with this, to get you to. So anyway, this giving potential is really cool because it just kind of walks out and say, look, if I decided to give $5 extra on top of what I normally give, between now and the end of the year, I would have given $185 to the vision offering. That's pretty cool, right, to think about. We can think $5, we can think of $185 and be like, whew, that's a lot. But then when you think it's only $5 a week. So I encourage you to think about this and make a pledge if you feel the Lord leading you to. And as you do, I ask you to honor that pledge. And then to remember that each time that you give your pledge, if you, you can pledge on here weekly, every other week, monthly or other. If you just want to do a one-time gift or whatever, it's totally up to you. But as you do this, make sure that you put it correctly. If you're going to give $120 and $20 for vision offering, then just put that on your envelope. Or put it, if you give online, make sure you put it there too. Just, hey, this is for tithes and offering. This is for vision. Okay? Lord, I thank you for your goodness. God, I thank you that you stepped up in Peter's life. When he had failed and done things he said he'd never do, you stepped up. You met him. So, Lord, I thank you for meeting us. And you've called us to follow you. And, Lord, let us not be so preoccupied by what you're calling other people to do. Let us focus on following you ourselves. So, Lord, we give to you, we surrender to you, we sacrifice for you, and we follow you, we akalatheo you. Give us the courage to walk your road. Give us the courage to die to ourselves. Give us the courage to take up our cross and follow you. Give us the courage to deny. Lord, I pray today that your Holy Spirit goes out with this message and that it would sit and it would hover and it would work and growth would happen because I know your word doesn't return void in Jesus name amen amen so uh, I don't exactly know how my boss wanted me to do this so <laughs> uh, we we have this and Jonathan oh they're right there at the back they're at the back table if you would, uh, Jonathan, so there's not so many people coming to one single spot, can you put like some right here and some right there? And that way you can get them on your way out today. Uh, we want to really, really encourage you. Please grab one of these. It may be easier for you to, okay, there's some up here too. Thank you. It may be easier for you just to grab it and fill it out today if you feel like the Lord's leading you to do it. That way you don't have to try to uh, find it throughout the week and bring it back and all that stuff. So if you're able to just to fill it out today and, and drop it, this part down to us today, that'd be great. God bless you. Have a great day. Don't forget, if it's your first time, I'd love to meet you right over here in the Connect Corner. Smile! <laughs>